from a trip to the ocean. I promised Milad on the phone that I would take her there next time. She paused for a few seconds, hesitant to respond, as if she didn't want to shock me before finally saying, no, you don't have a door. For a long time, whenever Milad asked me on the phone, daddy, where are you? I avoided using the word prison. I feared that it might be too much for her at her tender age to begin to live with this word and its weighty implications. Torn, I grappled with the question of whether I should nevertheless tell my daughter the truth, or should I hide the bitter reality to prevent the connotations of the word prison from lodging in her imagination. Through her visits, Milad came to understand what a prison is, long before she learned the meaning of the word. To her, it was a place without a door where her father was confined, which he was unable to leave. And for her, if there was no door, there could be no visit to the ocean, no breakfast to share, and no chance for me to accompany her to the nursery she fondly referred to as school. From the earliest moments of their lives, our children come to understand the reality of walls, barriers, and checkpoints. They do so long before they are introduced to the word occupation. So we ask ourselves a vexing question, one that is of utmost importance to their education. How do we turn the oppressive feeling created by this reality into a force for positive action, which could contribute to the constructive growth of their young and developing personalities? While thinking about whether I should use the word prison with Milad, memories from my years of captivity began to play in my mind. During these years, 
I found myself living alongside not just one, but three generations of prisoners. The father, the son, and the grandson. Perhaps it is the pervasiveness of prisons in the lives of children through their frequent visits to incarcerated family members, which brings them back to the confines of the prison as prisoners themselves. In one of my stories from Life in Prison, entitled Uncle, Give Me a Cigarette, a 12-year-old child prisoner asked me for a cigarette. In normal circumstances, outside the walls of the prison, I would have said no. We don't want children to smoke. But in this environment, it struck me that the child wanted by this request to grow up quickly so that he could better confront the years of confinement that now looms before him or perhaps recover from the violence of his arrest. By the act of smoking, he seemed to proclaim, Behold me, an adult. So I handed the child a cigarette. And in the presence of Milad, I finally spoke the word prison. In the end, I followed Milad's own cue to me. She had taught me the importance of honesty and truthfulness when raising children. In the end, it did not matter if she heard me use the word prison. In her heart, she already felt what it meant. It is a place without a door. Milad is about six or seven years old now. And when he took, managed to smuggle his sperm out of prison, and that is how his wife was able to conceive Milad. We will honor all our martyrs! We will honor all our martyrs! All the children, sons and daughters! All the children, sons and daughters! We will honor all our martyrs! We will honor all our martyrs! All the parents, mothers, fathers! All the parents, mothers, fathers! In prison, Talita Jawar has started educational programs, smuggled in writing, and conducted her own research. Talita writes this, in prison is like a flower that grows out of stone. For us Palestinians, education is our greatest weapon. With it, we will always be victorious. The Trinity of Fundamentals is a fictionalized account of Hassan Rafidi's life between 1982 and 1991, in which he goes into hiding in order to continue to serve the Palestinian national liberation struggle our fight is an internationalist one and an intergenerational one. Generation after generation, we are all part of this march of history. This is one long march against the imperialist world order. Gaza keeps us focused on our shared enemy. Meanwhile, we know that imprisonment is not just used as a tool by the Zionist entity. James Connolly, the Irish Republican and Socialist leader, issued a defiant warning to the British during the 1916 Easter Rising, declaring, if you strike at, imprison, or kill us, out of our prisons or graves, we will still evoke a spirit that will thwart you, and perhaps raise a force that will destroy you. We understand there to be three enemies of the Palestinian people. The first and most obvious is Zionism. The second is Arab reactionary forces. The Jordanian regime has actually aided the shipment of weapons to the Israeli occupation forces. The Egyptian regime continues to blockade our people in Gaza to stop aid from being let in. And most recently, they are now stopping their people from expressing their solidarity with Palestine. The third is Western imperialism. And it's no surprise that the nations that are the first to rise up for Palestine are also the ones that suffer at the sharpest end and the sharpest violence of imperialism. So to honor the regional dimension of our struggle, we're now going to hear some readings from non-Palestinian prisoners in the Arabic speaking world. Kipa was not a detainee like any other. Like me, she had fought for the resistance. She was captured in battle in the middle of an operation against the Israelis. Most importantly, Kipah was Palestinian, not Lebanese. She had grown up in Beirut in the Sabra and Shilta camps. She was there in 1982 when the camps came under attack by the militias of the Lebanese forces after the Israeli army entered Beirut. She was 11 years old at the time. She survived the massacre, although three of her brothers were killed. At the age of 17, she joined the Palestinian fighters. On October 24th, 1988, her group left to carry out an operation 
an attempt to capture Israeli soldiers for an eventual exchange of prisoners. Things went badly, and the group fell back to the occupied zone, taking refuge with a Lebanese family. Unfortunately, the father of the family worked for the security services. By the time some of the members of the group came upon a document proving this link, it was too late. The house was surrounded. After a brief exchange of fire, he found and her friends surrendered. They were all handled roughly and transferred to Israel for interrogation, ending up in Khiam. When I arrived, I had already heard of Pipa and knew what she had tried to do. Because of her attempted action and all the excitement it generated in the occupied zone, I even had to push back my own project by a couple of weeks. Kifa had been tortured very harshly in Qiyam, but she had managed to hold out. Inside the camp, I spotted her right away. She was 18 years old, smart and determined, a dark-haired slip of a girl with sad eyes and a brilliant smile. Lively and attractive, she had been the object of much attention before her arrest. She was religious, wore the veil, and tried hard to be a good Muslim. After we were put in the same cell, we quickly became fast friends. We had much in common. Both of us were fearless, young, and committed to the cause. She had no better relations with Abu Nabil than I. We were his two punching bags. Kifah, too, was allowed to meet with journalists, some Egyptians from Associated Press, who even left her a bit of money. We had agreed to keep in contact even if we were separated, which is what happened when Abu Nabil decided to put me in solitary. We made an appointment saying we would try to use the shower room as our letterbox. My ordeal didn't start with this prison stint. It began three months after the massacre in November 2013. I was released twice in 2014 and never thought of fleeing the country. I thought I would follow in my father's footsteps. I'd pay the price willingly, get out, go back to my family and my professional life and resume the struggle. But after five years in prison for a demonstration, I was not freed, but released to probation which required me to spend all night, 12 hours of every day, in the police station. Every time I complained of the cruelty of this punishment, someone would remind me that Mahmoud Darwish went through something similar and declared that the night was theirs and the day his. Palestine's always on the mind, but it seems the Egyptian regime didn't like the deal and just six months later begrudged me the day and sent me back to prison. Why didn't you run, my cellmates asked. To where, I reply, Gaza? All the other escape routes seem too dangerous, but why didn't I seriously consider escaping to Gaza? Had I let the news coverage of Gaza as an open-air prison blind me to the truth of what I had seen with my own eyes and written in my own article? Gaza is besieged, but it has not been taken captive, and the difference is enormous. If I were free in Gaza, instead of locked up in Cairo, I would read books, play with children, enjoy the company of women, walk on the beach, work and make a living. I'd teach and I'd learn. I would live and be alive this moment. I would have breathed the dust cloud of the whole national territory as it moved instead of trying to analyze it from afar. I regret not escaping to Gaza. I know it's naive. I know I've not lived under bombardment, that visiting a siege is different to living under it. I know that this idea that's taken hold of me is only a sign that I'm getting old. Yes, I long for you, Palestinians. But I also long for a time when my will had not been torn from me, when my defeat was not complete. I sign off every letter with a drawing for Khalid. My drawings know better than my singing, but autism pushes us to communicate without words. From memory, I drew a photo taken of us in Gaza. We were in Khan Yunus and the barrier was in the background. A group of Egyptians all looking in the camera. Khalid on my shoulders. As the photo is taken, Khalid turns to look at the fence and points to the horizon stretching out behind it. The only one preoccupied by the Palestine beyond. I ask his mother to play Reem Bana songs for him. I return to my cell humming, Garden of the Spirit. Do I have the right to dream of escaping to Gaza? Do I have the right to dream of a road to Cairo that passes through Gaza? Does a captive have the right to ask for help from the besieged? I know that these questions show how ancient I am, but I'm an Arab and Palestine's always on my mind. And in my defense, I'll say that I refuse to be humiliated in my country, and I never lowered my banners, and it should count that I stood in the face of my oppressors, an orphan, naked and barefoot. And my solace is that the tragedy I'm living is but my share of yours. I call out to you, you are always on my mind. Tuesday, April 16th, 2024, 
Adala Center has submitted on behalf of the family of the prisoner Walid Daqa a petition to the Israeli Supreme Court to compel the Israeli prison services and Israeli police to stop their violations by continuing to detain his body indefinitely. The petition also noted that this violation crowns a series of ongoing racist violations against the prisoner Walid Daqa throughout the journey of his captivity, illness, after the announcement of his martyrdom, and even in the attack on the tent of loyalty and the intimidation of the family in front of their house. We will continue our struggle as a family and through the Free Wali Daqa campaign to liberate him, complete his journey, reveal his works, and guard his words from distortion. Our cry will remain the resounding cry of Walid Daqa, and I quote, free the martyr prisoners, free the prisoner martyrs, until the freedom of all prisoners. From the river to the sea, free all the prisoners now. From the river to the sea, free all the prisoners now.